What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network. Here, continuing the reading of the Bitcoin Optech newsletter today, number sixteen, the Scaling Bitcoin Special on October ninth, two thousand and eighteen. This week's newsletter consists entirely of summaries of several notable talks presented at the Scaling Bitcoin Workshop last weekend. Since there was very little to report in our usual action items, news, and notable code changes section, we hope to return to our usual format next week. The workshop summary, Scaling Bitcoin 5 in Tokyo 2018. The fifth Scaling Bitcoin conference was held Saturday and Sunday in Tokyo, Japan. In the sections below, we provide brief overviews to some of the talks they, we, might, we think might be most in interesting to this newsletter's readers. But we also recommend watching the complete set of videos provided by the workshop organizers or reading the transcripts provided by Brian Bishop, the fastest typer in Bitcoin. For convenience, at the end of each summary, we directly link to its videos and transcripts and paper if available. Talks are listed below in the order they appeared in the workshop schedule. Warning, the following summaries may contain errors due to many of the talks describing subjects well beyond the expertise of the summary author. First talk, Adjusting Bitcoin's Block Subsidy, Research by Anthony Towns. This talk makes an intellectual inquiry into whether Bitcoin pays more for security than it needs to, and that we could do and what we could do if we decide it does pay too much. The speaker makes clear that he is interested in considering the question and providing possible answers, but that he's neither suggesting that there is a problem nor advocating for any solution. If the Bitcoin user base did think it was overpaying for security, the talk suggests its option for reducing the amount of subsidy paid in the short term as the amount of Bitcoin security increases, but still ensuring that no more than 21 million Bitcoin are paid overall in subsidy, potentially allowing the subsidy to last much longer than currently expected. Although the talk was not about a specific proposal, an example proposal it evaluated was to reduce the subsidy by 20% every time the network's proof of work security doubles, measured by block creation difficulty. Forward blocks on chain capacity increases without a hard fork. Research by Mark Friedenbach. One well-known method for soft forking an increase in the Bitcoin block size is extension blocks, a data structure that invisible to nodes that have not upgraded to the soft fork, and so it is not subject to their historic limit on block size. By itself, this is an undesirable method for increasing block size because preventing old nodes from seeing the transaction in the extension block also prevents them from being able to enforce any other consensus rules on those transactions, such as the rules that prevent a malicious user from spending other users' Bitcoin or from creating more Bitcoin than allowed by the 21 million Bitcoin subsidy schedule. However, one does not need to increase the block size to increase the amount of data that can be added to the blockchain per minute. It, all, it is also possible to increase capacity by increasing the frequency of blocks, that is reducing the average time between blocks. A method for gaming Bitcoin's difficulty adjustment algorithm, called a time warp attack, is well known amongst experts and has been used successfully in demonstration attacks against Bitcoin's testnets and real attacks against altcoins and shitcoins. Note, although Bitcoin is technically vulnerable to this attack, it'd be a slow attack that would give the user base a significant amount of time to respond. By itself, increasing block frequency is also an undesirable method for increasing capacity because shorter block intervals increase the effectiveness of miner with large amounts of hash rate, 
and so is likely to increase mining centralization. Perhaps this Proving the saying that two wrongs don't make a right. This talk describes a novel way of combining extension blocks and the time warp attack to allow both upgraded nodes and old nodes to gain the same capacity increase and see all the same transactions for validating while simultaneously slightly reducing mining centralization risk. Uh, upgraded nodes would validate one or more extension blocks, called forward blocks, that provide additional block space with a centralized reducing 15-minute average interval. But the upgraded nodes would also restrict the time stamps in legacy block to ensure a permanent but limited time warp attack increased the frequency of legacy blocks enough to allow them to include the same transaction that previously appeared in the forwarded blocks. Compact multi-signature for smaller blockchains. Research by Dan Bonin, Manu Drivers, and Gregory Nubin. This talk describes an alternative to Schnorr signature sh schemes described in the MUSIC paper that makes use of paired-based cryptography, specifically an adaption of the Bonan Lin Shakam BLS signature scheme. Although pairing-based schemes require an additional fundamental security assumption beyond those made by both Bitcoin's current ECDSA scheme and the proposed Schnorr scheme, the authors present evidence that their scheme would produce smaller signatures in general, allow non-interactive signature aggregation, and make it possible to prove which members of the set of signers actually work together to create a threshold signature that is a K of M signers, for example, a two out of three multisig. Accumulators, a scalable drop-in replacement for Merkle trees. Research by Benedict Bunz, Benjamin Fish, and Dan Bonet. In Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, scalable commitments to sets of information, such as transactions or UTXOs, are normally made using Merkle trees that allow proving an element is a member of a set by generating a proof whose size and validation cost is roughly the log of 2n for a set of n elements. This talk describes an alternative method based on RSA accumulators that provide potential benefits, which are the size of a proof is constant no matter how many elements are member of the set, and adding or removing elements from an accumulator can be efficiently batched, that is, one update per block. Multi-party elliptical curve digital signatures for Scriptless Lightning Network Payment Channels, research by Connor Fromknecht. Routable payment channels, such as those used by Lightning Network, currently use multiple opcodes from the script language that are enforced by Bitcoin's consensus rules. Previous works on scriptless scripts by Andrew Polstra has suggested that some or all of these opcodes currently used could be replaced by Schnorr public keys and signatures that would be created privately, that is off-chain, between the participants in a payment channel. Consensus rules would still require that a spending transaction have a valid signature that references a known public key, but none of the other security-related information would appear on-chain, reducing data consumption and fees, improving privacy and fungibility, and potentially improving security. Well, that is a win-win-win. Bitcoin does not currently support Schnorr signatures and no complete design for it has been proposed, although such proposals may not be far off. So this talk describes proof of concept results from a practical implementation of payment channel scriptless scripts that's compatible with Bitcoin's current ECDSA keys and signatures. Some impressive savings are achieved in the size of scripts and witness data, and savings which increase the number of channels that can be opened or closed in a block, and which reduces the amount of transaction fees paid by users of Lightning Network payment channels. Discussion, the evolution of Bitcoin script. 
a two-hour discussion group focused on this topic mentioned a large variety of proposed changes to Bitcoin script language. Far too many to mention here in a summary. However, a few changes were mentioned as a theoretical possible to accomplish in 2019 if the community is willing to adopt them. Schnorr Signature Scheme, an opt-in feature providing smaller signature in all cases, faster validation, much smaller public key and signature data for cooperative multisig, and easier compatibility with scriptless script. See Peter Woolley's proposed BIP. Sickash no input, unsafe. The ability to create spend without explicit referencing which output you want to spend, allowing, cr allows creating more efficient payment channels using the L2 protocol that also makes it easy for each channel to support up to 150 participants, CBIP 118. Op Chexic from Stack, which makes it possible to create covenants that restrict what output a particular coin can be spent to. For example, you could put a mandatory timeout of one week on spends from your cold wallet. During the timeout, you could only spend the coins back to your own cold wallet. But if you waited for the timeout to expire, you could spend the coins to any arbitrary address. This means that if someone stole a copy of your cold wallet's private key, you could use this mechanism to prevent them from spending your Bitcoin by returning them to your cold wallet during the timeout period. It was noted that some developers are opposed to enabling the simplest form of this opcode for fungibility reasons, although alternative approaches may be more acceptable. Fixing the time warp bug. A set of miners controlling a majority of the hash rate can cause can currently manipulate Bitcoin's difficulty adjustment algorithm to allow them to constantly create more than one block every 10 minutes, even without increasing the overall hash rate. There is at least one simple proposal to reduce the amount of manipulation possible without breaking older software or mining equipment. See the recent email thread in the Bitcoin dev mailing list. Explicit fees. Currently, fees in Bitcoin are implied by the differences between the value of the aggregated inputs and the aggregated outputs. However, the transaction could alternatively explicitly commit to the fee and allow one of the outputs to be set to the difference between the value of the aggregated inputs and the explicit fee plus all the other outputs. This could be useful for rewarding Lightning Network watchtowers that send brand breach remedy transactions on behalf of offline users. Or it could be useful for fee bumping group transactions. However, one member of the discussion group suggested that, and now to quote, the only people who have comfort with soft forks are unlikely to propose a soft fork and produce software that would be adopted. People are going to fight anything that adds anything, especially considering the recent uh, inflation bug. People are going to be, uh, for the next six months, significantly more conservative. It's going to be another six months before people are even thinking about it. I don't think we're going to get any new soft work in the new next year. Special thanks. We thank Andrew Polstra, Anthony Towns, Brian Bishops, and Peter Woolley for providing suggestions for answering questions related to the content of this newsletter. Any remaining errors are entirely the fault of the newsletter's author. Footnotes. When a miner creates a new block at the tip of a chain, he can begin working on the next block immediately. But every other miner is still working on an old block until they receive this new block meaning their proof of work during that brief period of time is wasted. It neither increases network security nor provides that the miner with financial compensation. Miners with more hash rate produces more blocks on average. So they get the head start more often and less of their proof of work is wasted. For two per perfect fair miners, half a world apart, the mi minimum pr practical network Delay between is about 0 0.2 seconds, 
meaning a small miner, far away from most other miners, is likely to only be provided for 599.8 of the average 600 seconds, which is 10 minutes, between blocks. A of 0.2 divided by 600, loss of efficiency, which is 0.03, is probably acceptable. But if the block frequency were increased, the loss of efficiency would increase also. A one block per minute, the loss of efficiency would be 0.33%. Add one block per six seconds, 3.33%. The small miner could increase this, his efficiency by moving closer to other miners or even completely eliminating the efficiency loss by merging with them. But this is the mining centralization that is essential to avoid in Bitcoin if we want to pre prevent miners from being able to easily censor which transactions are included in blocks. Peers, you should really subscribe to the Optech newsletter, and I thank especially all the contributors uh, to this phenomenal research, and of course, all the participants of the Scaling Bitcoin Conference. Peers, thank you very much for joining me here, and see you on the next read. Bye-bye.